glad you're here. We got a lot of things happening this morning. Man, wow, worship was just powerful. That was awesome. Come on. Aren't you glad for your worship team? I am too. Next level. Uh, a couple things real quick that I just want to uh, bring your attention to. Number one, we're, we promise we're going to be pouring parking soon. Uh, so if somebody will make a call to God and cut the rain out, we can uh, get started on that project. So we're going to be pouring on the north side over here, almost 9,000 square feet of parking. And so um, we're going to be asking you in the next few weeks to help us pay for that, just kind of giving you a heads up, all right? So, but we're, we're going to make room for people, amen? <laughs> and then um, for those that don't know, uh, I said it last week, and so I'm putting it on repeat right now. Uh, we care more about your soul than your feeling, your feelings, okay? Uh, and that's a good thing, okay? <laughs> You're at a good church when they care more for your soul uh, than, than how you feel. But we, we also do care how you feel. That's, that's not to say that. But, uh, but we have an incredible, incredible library that is building week after week. It's an online discipleship uh, library. It's on our website. And uh, we're taking this year, and, and all the pastors on staff, we're covering, uh, we have some guest, guest teachers as well. Uh, th th these are short devotional, short discipleship uh, teachings, uh, 10 to 15 minutes. We air them live on Wednesday nights at 6.30. <clears throat> but if you want to know something, if you want to learn more, if you're curious what the Bible says about giving, about uh, salvation, uh, um, all, we're, we're covering all the things, okay? So go to our website, um, under media, you can find all of that, and uh, just take 10, 15 minutes out of your day, uh, learn a little more about God's word, grow deeper in your, your walk with God, grow stronger in your walk with God, amen? amen. So <clears throat> we're making it as easy as possible for you. You're already sitting down, and that lazy boy, so just that you bought a Bob Mills or wherever you bought a Craigslist, you know, and uh, just while you're there, grab the device and, and learn, okay? Amen? Amen? Yes. A, a, a growing church is a learning church. Yes. A growing Christ follower is a learning Christ follower. Yes. But we're not talking about that today. So <laughs> we are still in our series on the book of Acts. Have you guys have been enjoying this series? Like, yes. man, this has been, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, just the, we get incredible feedback out of this. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 8. And, and as I talk about all the time, in full transparency, <clears throat> there's a lot that's happening in, in Acts chapter 8. And it's just not fair that I don't have the time with you to cover everything that's happening here. So to pick up where we were last week. Last week was, was a tough Sunday. It was a heavy topic, wasn't it? If you were here, it was like uh, it was pin drops were heard in... But it was needed. Uh, it was good for my soul. And I know it was good for yours as well. And so we, we left off at the stoning of Stephen. And we pick up in chapter 8. The story just continues. Like nothing has cha nothing's changed in terms of where the story is. <clears throat> and so in Acts chapter 8, uh, Saul is still Saul. He's not had his conversion to Paul yet. And this guy's just, he's, he's wreaking havoc and hell on the local church. Uh, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 8 that he is literally going into people's homes, like busting in the doors and dragging them out to be jailed. Like This is what's happening. And, and remember when we started this series, I told you like Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 3, it's all like uni unicorns and rainbows, man, like people are getting saved and the church is growing and, and the disciples and these new converts, like they're actually out in the temple and, and they're, just, they're just flaunting their faith. But, but isn't it funny just how quick sometimes things can just change in life, amen, like Come on, somebody. You didn't even ask for the circumstance to change, right? It didn't, it didn't ask for persecution. It just found you, right? Like trouble found you. Growing up, I got in trouble a lot. And I would always tell my dad, like, Dad, I'm not looking for trouble. He goes, no, I know that, son. It's looking for you, and you keep finding it. <laughs> and so it is in the church with persecution. And... The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 8, and I'm doing a lot of paraphrasing, so you just have to read it for yourself uh, before we get to where we are. So in Acts chapter 8, the Bible tells us this. 
Now, because of the persecution, uh, it says the saints, the disciples, were scattered abroad. Like they just, they dispersed. What I find interesting about that is the best way I can uh, this, you know, think of this analogy is like a shotgun shell. And I'm not going to do the whole vanilla ice thing that you want me to, but, you know, <laughs> shotgun shell. Okay, so a shotgun shell, and when you, the, the shell, the round is intended that when it leaves the barrel of the gun, the purpose of it is for it to scatter because you're shooting pheasants or birds or I've got a snake charmer that I use when I'm out at my land because there's a lot of snakes. And so I, I want to, I'm not a good shot. I just want to make sure I hit this snake, right? Come on, somebody. And, and I know we got the good snake people in the house, but I'm not that guy. Sorry, I don't know what to tell you. You know these people. They're probably sitting next to you. So, no, oh, those are good snakes. They eat the bat. I've never seen a good snake eat a bat snake. I have yet to see that. But at any rate, apparently it's a thing. So back to my point. As this round, as, as the pellets are, are leaving the barrel of this gun, it just, it, it just scatters. <clears throat> And I love this because what, what the enemy intended to do, what he thought by scattering the church would weaken the church, the church began to grow even faster because of persecution. And we don't do well with persecution here in the West. Ain't nobody got time for that. Give me an easy life, Jesus. Come on, somebody. Jesus, when I got saved, you promised me an easy life. Nothing bad was going to happen. Everything was going to go my way. I'd get all the best parking spots. I would never have to walk along, walk into the grocery store. I would always be in a line with 15 items or less, and I would have 16. And, you know, this is the Western mentality of God in church. I want an easy life. Well, I got real news for you. <laughs> That's not in your Bible. <laughs> it's not. You can't find it. And because of persecution, the church grew. And so it will continue to grow in 2021. As the church, us, we are the church. Amen? Yeah. You, you track it with me. Say amen. Yeah. Like, what I, you know what I mean by that. We, we've been in this whole series where the church is being birthed, this, this building is not the church. We're just kind of gathering here once a week to hear the word of God, to encourage one another, and to baptize one another in water, which we're about to do. Like, we're the church. Someone say, I'm the church. I'm the church. And in 2021 and 2022, however long the Lord tarries, we know what scripture says. There's going to be pressure on us as Christ followers. Now, for us, let's be honest, I doubt any of us will see the day where someone's like kicking in our door and they're dragging us out to go be jailed. Maybe so, I don't know. But our persecution's going to come in the form of like a social persecution, social situations, uh, standing up for your, your beliefs at work or even with your family. On, on certain issues. And, and so persecution will happen. And here's what we need to know, that under persecution, the church flourishes and it grows as it's intended to. So we're in Acts chapter eight, verse 26. Um, so it says this, now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. Philip was a, uh, an apostle, a believer. And, and he said, all right, Philip, arise, get up. I love how detailed God is, right? Like, get up, go south along the road, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. It's in the desert, by the way, Philip. So he arose and he went, and behold, there was a man of Ethiopia. This is where he's from. He's from the continent of Africa. He's a eunuch. We'll talk a little bit about this, who that was, why that's important. He was a man of great authority, right? A man of incredible authority under Candace. Now, we have to understand this about this woman named Candace, this is not her name. This would be like someone saying Pharaoh, okay? This is just a general name for a queen. And so this queen of the Ethiopians, who had char he had charge over all of her money. He was holding on to the cheese and had, he had come to Jerusalem to worship. He was going back home. He's sitting in his chariot. 
um, he's, he's reading the, the prophet Isaiah, and then the Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip had been practicing for the Olympics. This chariot is trucking down the road. You gotta imagine this, okay? This dude's sitting in his chariot. Because of who he is, he, there's no way this guy is alone. He's probably got guards with him in this enclosed chariot. And he's got this scroll out. And he's like, hmm, this is interesting, the prophet Isaiah. And he's reading along. And as his chariot's going through the desert, Philip's like, Usain Bolt to the chariot. And he's, now listen, he's running up beside the chariot. And he says to him, do you understand what you are reading? I do understand what you're reading. You know, and he's running. And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. And the place in the scripture which he read was this. This is important. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. This is talking about Jesus. And as a lamb before its shear is silent, so uh, he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who would declare uh, his generation for his life is taken from the earth? So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does this prophet say this is? Is it himself or some other man? This guy is just, imagine an unbeliever that you know, that knows nothing about scripture, that you say you go to church and you know God, but all of a sudden they've stumbled across the Bible online or something, or they were downloading apps, they accidentally downloaded the Bible app, I don't know, and they're, but they're reading and they, this guy genuinely does not know who the prophet Isaiah is writing about. And he says, who is it? So Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here's water. What keeps me from being baptized? So at some point, at some point, this eunuch had heard about water baptism. I mean, as far as we know, it's not in the text where Philip says, oh, by the way, there's Jesus, there's water baptism, there's baptism in the Holy Spirit. So maybe he was in Jerusalem. Maybe he was there on the day of Pentecost. And 3,000 people get saved, and they baptize 3,000 people in water that day. And maybe the eunuch was around. He's like, this, this is pretty interesting. Why the 3,000 people are being baptized in water? Like, this is, I don't know, but somehow... This eunuch knew about water baptism. And so he says, look, there's some water out in the middle of the desert, by the way. God's pretty cool. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Setting us all up for something. So there's, they're in the desert. There's water. And he says, what keeps me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, right, that Jesus is the son of God, you may. And so he says, you know, he goes, I believe. And so he commanded the chariot to stop. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Amen. Now when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. That's kind of weird. That's, don't you think? If you're the eunuch, you're like, oh, man, what? <laughs> there were two of us in this water here in the desert. One of them just <laughs> vanished into thin air. And uh, the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Let's give the Lord a praise. I just read a lot. Okay, give me a second. <clears throat> There's a lot happening here. <laughs> There's a lot happening here. So today, uh, we're talking about water baptism, uh, why we do it, why we believe it's important. And, um, and so today, we're going to give you an opportunity to be baptized in water. Now, I'm going to come full circle on all of that in just a few moments. Um, the, the word baptism, here's how it's defined. Uh, to dip repeatedly. So if you were thinking about it, you're like, well, how many times are you going to dip me? We're just going to dunk you once, okay? Um, now, if your spouse is there and they're like, Pastor, dip him again, I don't think we got it all out. Uh, if you could hold him under till the, till the bubble stop, that would be good. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> to dip repeatedly, to immerse, to submerge, to cleanse, by dipping or by submerging, to wash, to make clean with water, it's, it's a baptism. It's, it's a symbol. Everyone say symbol. symbol. It's a symbol. So our beliefs um, on water baptism follow this order. First of all, there's salvation. So 
what we believe at Crossroads um, is that in, in order to be baptized in water, so water baptism follows your conversion. Does that make sense? Right? So let's say, for example, today you're moved by what I'm saying. The Holy Spirit is stirring your heart like, oh, man, I want some of this Jesus thing. Like, sign me up for the team. How do I do it? I'm going to give you a chance in a moment. And then you're like, oh, okay, now I'm saved like this unit. Because Philip asked him, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And he says, yes, I believe. He's like, so there's salvation. And now here's water baptism. Um, water baptism is, is so, so important because it is a public confession. It's an outward sign of an inward change. This is why it's so important. Now, you're kind of sitting there and you're like, well, it's, it's just water. Is it that important? And the answer is unequivocally, yes, it is that important. And here's why it's so important. Because we're told in Scripture to talk about our faith. We're, we're told, like, to go make disciples, not make more Christians. The world doesn't need any more Christians, just being honest. We got a lot of them, and a lot of them are doing more harm than they're doing good for us. But, man, you get a disciple in the game, someone who actually just genuinely loves Jesus, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, uh, I remember uh, uh, my mom's parents, uh, when my granddad passed first and shortly after, um, my grandmother passed away. And so Holly and I had just met, and uh, we might even be engaged yet. I don't know. So we went to go see her, and she was all alone. She lived way up in North Texas in a, a town. If I said, nobody would even know where it's at, <clears throat> but north of Wichita Falls. She lived in this town by herself, this big old house. So we'd go often to visit her. And my, my grandparents loved the Lord. Uh, my, my granddad, before I was born, got radically saved. Uh, he was one of those guys that when he got saved, he got, like, all of him got saved. Come on, somebody. Uh, and he did. He got, I had long, really long hair in high school. He didn't like that. But at any rate, um, but no, he, he got radically saved. He sold his farm, got out of farming, and, and became a preacher and planted churches. And it was incredible. Okay. But I remember just, just <clears throat> excuse me, literally days before my grandmother passed, <clears throat> we were sitting with her, and, uh, and I, I was lonely for her, right? I was like, this is my grandmother. They raised me. I, I spent, because uh, both of my parents worked, we just spent every day at their house after school. And uh, the sweet memories. I was just lonely for my grandmother. I was like, grandmother, I was like, I hate it that you're in this big house alone. She goes, oh, I'm not alone. She goes, the Holy Spirit's here with me. And that, I remember that to this day. And I say all that to say because she loved her Lord. Yeah. See, a disciple, they don't need anything else. Yeah, it's we're, we're, this is why water baptism is so important. Because we're showing not just our church family, but we're announcing to the world that, hey, I believe in Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. I am saying to the world that I am denying myself and I am deciding to follow Jesus. Uh, it's not lost on me that there are possibly some of you today that are here that maybe you uh, experienced like an infant baptism. Uh, thank you, brother. Give it up for Isaac. Come on, somebody. That's good. Walmart water right there. It's the best you're going to get. It's even purified. Whatever that means. So, yeah, this is so important because um, I, I want to be clear. Like, in no way are, are we invalidating your baptism. Okay, stay with me. Uh, this is not to make, uh, this. I'm not in any way trying to make fun of, make light of, maybe experience that you had possibly um, in another denomination growing up. Is everybody with me? Okay. I just pastor this church, and I can only tell you what we believe and how we do it, okay? Again, this is not invalidating anything that you experience. This is not, uh, you know, poking fun or making fun of, of, of infant baptism or whatever that might have looked like for you. But we're saying at Crossroads, 
like salvation has to be a conscious, willing choice, right? So when my kids were born, uh, just like we do once a month, we'll, we dedicate children, right? We bring up these, and you guys are doing a fantastic job at having babies left and right. Like we're literally growing the church pretty fast. So, <laughs> and so we bring these little babies up here and sometimes they let me hold them and they're really sweet and then they see the beard and they, some of them start crying and fear the beard and it's, <laughs> it's a whole thing. But we bring these children up here and we ooh and all of these babies as we should. And I'm imagining there's like somebody up here with a baby. Okay, so, uh, and, and we're back, we're, 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 excuse me, we're, we're uh, thank you, Holly, Pastor Holly. We're dedicating, it's, it's a big word for me. Uh, we're dedicating these children to the Lord. Now this, this baby has no clue what's going on. This baby's not, he's like, oh, that's right. We're, oh, today's my dedication day. This is pretty cool. Mom, make sure you dress me up nice, do my hair. No, it, dedication is for the children. In 1 Samuel, where we actually get dedication from, when Samuel was dedicated by his mother Hannah and the prophet Eli, he didn't know what was going on. He was a baby. He was a baby. He didn't, it was dedication, baby dedication is for the parents. It's not for the, for the baby. Now, later, you might show pictures and talk about what happened, but it's for the parents and the grandparents. You know, it's, 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 what, it's a ritual. It's a thing we go through for us as parents, as grandparents. Okay. But when I get older or as our kids grew up and they could begin to understand the concepts of salvation, of water baptism, of baptism in the Holy Spirit. Like, you, you know your kid better than I do. This is like when we do communion and you have children in here and I say, hey, parents, that's up to you. Like, I, you know your kids better than I do. If they get what's going on, then I say let them participate in it. If not, maybe hold back. And so we always encourage, like with water baptism, like your kid probably needs to be in an age where they can grasp what's, what's happening, Amen. So there is a public confession of my faith that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the risen Lord. I believe in his death, burial, and resurrection. And then after that, after that, every believer is to be baptized in water. Amen? Yeah. Oh, and also baptized in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Now, if you're sitting there and you're kind of wondering, you're like, okay, I'm 50-50 I'm with you, Pastor Matt. I'm halfway there. Well, let me get you all the way there. Let's, let's cross the finish line together. Do we believe that water baptism saves you? No, we don't. Um, we're using purified Belton water, <laughs> city of Belton water. Uh, for those that don't know, this is old school. Before this building was here, we actually have a well out back. Make sure I'm pointing in the right direction. Yeah, we have a well here. This because property was bought in the early 80s or late 70s, and they came and built here in the 80s. So there's a well out here, a working well, by the way. So we used to use this well water. And, and if you were ever baptized, it's as, it's as cold as ice when it comes out of the ground. You know, I'm, you're taking one for the team when you get baptized in well water. <laughs> I'm just saying. For your baptism to mean something, does it have to happen at church property? No. I mean, this dude's out in the middle of the desert, and all of a sudden, a lake appears, a body of water. However, that, however God did that. And so I can remember as a kid uh, in Caldwell, Texas, in Lake Somerville, and that's where I was, first time I was baptized was in a lake with, with my dad. He drug me out. I willingly went. <laughs> and uh, listen to what it says in Matthew 20, 18, uh, 28, uh, verse 19, uh, the Great Commission, not the Great Suggestion, by the way. Go then to all peoples everywhere. Go to everybody everywhere. Go to everybody everywhere. I've had the privilege of baptizing our church members in the Jordan River. Uh, we, we participated in Africa. Uh, I, I've gotten the pleasure of baptizing people on, on several different continents and many different countries. And it's, it's magnificent everywhere. It's powerful everywhere. 
And he says, go out to Belton and Temple and Salado and Morgan's Point and Academy and Colleen and Fort Hood and Harker Heights. Like, go out there and make a bunch of Christians that go to church. Didn't say that. Go make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I got to move quickly. Um, For those that don't know, I I, I read this and I I shared it with our executive team. And then I ended up sharing it with our entire staff because it just moved me to my core. And I'll be quite honest with you, it really convicted me in my faith. But doing some research for today, I stumbled across an article. It was an organization called FAI. And uh, it, th- there's an incredible story behind it. This, this young husband and wife, God m- was moving on their hearts so much, uh, they both drop out of college, and, and they move to Iraq. These, these white college young people with no training, no field experience, they just moved to Iraq. I don't even know how you get into Iraq, but they found their way in. And they began making disciples, and this church in Iraq just began to take off. And then they went into Syria, into Jordan, and Amman. I mean, come on, somebody. These are not like uh, tourist-friendly, you know, just not a lot of, you know, condos for sale right now, I don't think, in Iraq and Syria. And so, But there's this organization they started called FAI, and what they're finding out through their missionary work is in Iran today, Hear this, church. Please, everyone lean in. Iran, where the Ayatollahs rule with an iron thumb and an iron fist. And today in Iran, there is an incredible, they're calling it the Iranian awakening. Now listen to these quotes from these believers that are there. The fastest growing church in the world has taken root, and I'm going to kind of explain that, so we'll just move on, in Iran. Here's what one of the believers said. What if I told you that Islam is dead? What if I told you the mosques are empty inside Iran? What if I told you no one follows Islam inside of Iran? Would you believe me? And he says, this is exactly what's happening inside of Iran. God is moving powerfully. Yeah, I'm going somewhere. Stay with me. And they go on to say, what persecution did was destroy the church that were not disciples and the church that were not about converts. Did you catch that? Persecution separated those who were serious about their faith and those who were not. What does this have to do with water baptism? Because these believers are being baptized in water in public. For us, we're going to walk outside and being a beautiful awning and with people cheering and clapping for us. Oh, there? The minute you walk out of your house, you might not ever walk back to your house because you identify as a Christ follower. I believe that God wants to start an awakening here. I believe that God is wanting to use the conditions of our culture not to make the church withdraw and and become reclusive but to open our doors even wider become even bolder about our faith if our brothers and sisters in iran are willing to go out in public and be baptized in water what is stopping us from showing the world and our church family through water baptism that jesus is lord of our life Um, yeah, do you have to be baptized in water to be saved? No. Because here's the thing. What about the thief on the cross? Right? As far as we know, he never, he never went to the synagogue to pray. I don't know if he ever took a sacrifice once a year to the priest to, to atone for his sins. I, I kind of doubt it. And listen, if you're hanging on a Roman cross, you did something really bad, okay? Um, he, he never was went through confirmation classes probably of any kind and never sat through Sunday school with the felt, felt board teaching. Come on, somebody. That's old school. You know, before we had these nice, like, movie quality projectors, you know, the, the overhead projector, and then you're in worship and the person who's doing it isn't paying attention and the words are upside down. Come on, somebody. That's old church. Y'all don't even know about that. Get out of here with that. 
didn't sit in a pew somewhere and open up a hymnal? Is it no? Do you have to be baptized in water to be saved? The qualified answer is no. But if you can, why wouldn't you? Why, why would you not? If Jesus can hang naked on a cross in front of his mother, can we not go public with our faith through water baptism? Um, yeah, that's a good time to clap. I'll share these two stories just real quick. Um, I'm sorry, guys. I know my team is like, Pastor Matt, you got to wrap this up. I get it. I'm, I'm tracking with you. Um, in 2015, 2014, you guys have heard this if you've been here a while. I've been open about kind of my mental health and, and, and depression and that sort of thing. And so I'm coming out of 2014. I went on a men's event with some friends in 2015. Some of you have been on a similar event uh, that I was on. And uh, it, was, it was January. It was South Texas. It had snowed the day before. And uh, the people that kind of organized this event, they're like, it's never snowed here before. And, and it didn't like just, it did the snow that it did like a few weeks ago. And so it snowed the day before and there was a pool. And that afternoon after lunch, the facilitator of the men's event, he's like, hey, if you're here today and you want to be baptized in water, we're going to, we'd like to offer that to you. And so I'm just being honest with you, right? Like I'm, I'm thinking, I'm like, well, I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor. I don't, I don't need to be baptized in water. I've done that like 10 times already. Because, you know, as a kid, we thought it was a pool. So when my dad would fill up the water baptism, we'd like just go cannonball in before the church showed up. Anyway, that's true. Sorry. And, of course, eating all the communion that was left over, that was the best part of communion, too. Um, so I, I'm literally, as the guy's talking, I'm like, I'm just thinking to myself, like, I'm a pastor. I, I baptize people in water. I don't get baptized. You know how arrogant that even sounds? Like, trust me, as I'm saying it again, it's like rubbing me the wrong way too. And I was like, I'm a pastor. Like, I, I baptize people. <sighs> you know, they don't baptize me. And the Holy Spirit's like, really? Is that, is that really what you want to do right now? And I'm like, no. <laughs> so... And then, of course, I'm like, well, you know what? It's so cold. I don't want to catch a cold, God. You don't want me to catch a cold. I got to go back and preach Sunday. I can't be getting sick in the water, Lord. Come on, somebody. I'm, try I'm telling, thinking of every excuse I can think of. Well, I can't take my shirt off. I, you know, I look fat getting out of the water. We know if the shirt sticks to me. Like, I'm, I'm trying to work out every excuse I can. And the facilitator's like, all right, who wants to be baptized in water? And all these guys are like, yeah, me, me. And they're all excited. And so I'm telling you, we all go outside to witness this. And I'm just as nervous as I can be inside. Um, it's really cool because on this event, you don't, you're not allowed to say what you do for a living. So for me, really, it was like great because like no one leaned on me for anything. And so I'm just in there soaking up. These guys being baptized, we're going nuts. We're cheering as these new lives come out of the water. And... and and the line keeps getting shorter, or the water keeps getting closer. I look behind, nobody's behind me. I was like, now I'm like, now I, I can't be that guy, right? So in all full transparency, I said, you know what, Lord? I didn't come all this way to give you half of me. If I'm going to do it at, at this stage of life, then, then I want everything that you have for me. And so being saved already already having been baptized in water more than once, being a pastor, this is just a few years ago, I went and I jumped in the pool. It was January 22nd of 2015. And I said to my brothers that were there, I'm, I'm giving my life to Jesus again. I, I just want him to have all of me. And it just, it was cold. I ain't even gonna play with you. It was cold. But man, just, I just, as I'm telling the story, I'm feeling it again. That joy of coming out of the water, knowing I've been washed in the blood, saying to my brothers that I'm a new creation, amen. Um, stand to your feet all across this place. So um, on, on March the 17th, uh, two, uh, 2009, um, some of you remember when Jordan passed away, uh, Two weeks before that, um, he wanted to be baptized. And so 
I told his dad, I was like, Keith, I was like, they wanted to come up to church um, like on, a, on, like on a, just a regular day, like a Tuesday or Wednesday during the day. And I was like, Keith, you know, water baptism is, is really meant for the whole church to see, you know, here's what this is about. And uh, something just told me like, you know what, if the dad wants to baptize his son, let's go just run some water and do it. So behind here, believe it or not, there's still a, a baptistry back there. Uh, and so we ran some water, we waited for it to fill up because it's this massive thing. And uh, me and his dad, we baptized him. And two weeks later, he died in a car accident. Now, I say that because, number one, I can't even imagine how it would have felt and his dad would have felt who survived the car accident had that not taken place. Did Jordan need uh, water baptism to go to heaven as a kid? No, no. But in that moment, God knew more than what I knew. And so he still does today. Okay, so there's many of you, I really believe that God has moved on your heart to be baptized in water today. And I need you to know that we have literally removed every obstacle, anything that you could think of. Trust me, we brainstormed this week, wrote down what could be the excuses someone would say. And we've removed them all. We have clothes for you, everything. We have, we have all the things that you need, t-shirts, shorts, underwear. We have towels, we have people. We have pastors ready to bat. We got water. We got water. So no head bound, every eye, cl- every eye open, no head bound. And if you're on church online, please participate uh, and go dunk yourself in the tub when you're done. I don't know, we'll figure that one out. No, but in all seriousness, you say, Pastor Matt, I'm here, and, and I want to confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. A, you've never, you've never said that before, or you want to rededicate your life right now on the count of three. Just want you to raise your hand right where you are. One, two, three. Keep them up for me, please. Keep them up. Come on. Why are we not clapping for all Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Keep them up for me. Come on. Let's keep clapping. Anyone else? Anyone else? Man, keep them up for me. All right. So if you raise your hand, you've got to get out of here and go be baptized in water. Number two, if you are kind of maybe identifying with my story, that now you're an adult again, and you're like, man, I want to, I want to do this thing again. I want to do this in front of my spouse or my kids. Oh, by the way, just so you know, parents, your kids are being taught the same thing today. So you might go pick them up and they're like, hey. I want to go be baptized in water, Dad and Mom. Do not prevent your kids. Like, go, it's right there. We have clothes for kids as well. Amen? All right, so we're going to give you permission to leave. If you want to hang around and watch uh, people get baptized in water, you're welcome to do that. But do not leave here today if you know you've never been baptized in water, you've never gone public with your faith, or you want to do it again. Man, let's do it in Jesus' name, amen? Let's go rock hell. Let's go have some fun today, amen?